just put your video, they'll be able to just see you speaking here. Um, okay. Which is fine. I guess you can decide. I was going to kind of walking around, but I didn't think you thought you were going to see all of your That might be a good thing. Okay, I'll get ready. I'll put it on the video. Oh, okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the bioinformatics seminar. Um, today, I'm introducing Eric Daughtery, the president of Persone, which is a global healthcare organization that's a parent company of Persone Diagnostics, Persone Connect, and Persone Analytics. Eric has previously worked in global leadership positions at a variety of healthcare companies, including GlaxoSmithKline, Abbott Laboratories, Uvanta Pharmacy Systems, AstraZeneca, and Glock Incorporated. He has two MBAs, one in international marketing and one in management from St. Louis University and Washington University. And he also has two graduate certifications from Harvard Business School and St. Louis University in executive leadership development and global operational leadership. Uh, please welcome Eric Dodger. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. And thanks for the time this morning. It's right now about what a quarter till or so. Um, and Eric Doherty, uh, I actually have a, a really distinct connection with you all as well. I've got two boys that are actually students here at UGA. I've got one that's uh, in Terry, and then I got one that just got into Grady last week. So I'm very proud of that. So pretty cool. One's a junior, one's a senior. So definitely well connected into what you all are doing from a student standpoint and a university standpoint. Um, you know, my background, as Olivia mentioned, is, is pretty much all in healthcare. Uh, my dad was a pharmacist, so I grew up in that environment. Uh, he was a pharmacist for a number of drugstores, uh, mainly within the Walgreens uh, pharmacy chain, running businesses. And so that's kind of where my appreciation of what's being done in the healthcare sector really started. So just some background there. Um, one of the questions that came up for me, and I wasn't sure within your group, and I know there's a number of folks in disparate uh, kind of areas around uh, different, um, you know, corporate settings. Um, have Does UGA have any type of SAS training? When I say SAS training, S-A-S, Institute um, Platform Training. Is there anything like that that's going on now within the UGA setting? Yeah, basically uh, like a, a machine learning and generative learning. Okay, just was curious if that's been done with you all or not. So we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, I will send this over to Jara to send out to you all so you guys can have this presentation for uh, your purposes. So I'm um, just making sure I put my LinkedIn there. And so definitely link in with me if you can, that would be great. Um, one of the things that I am obviously going to be speaking on is AI. And as you all have probably known over the past few months, uh, it's become a hot topic uh, in a number of sectors. And obviously in the healthcare sector, being a primary, you know, um, when it comes to generative AI and the ability to look at data and then transpond into predictive data that may or may not help that patient, it gets pretty scary. I mean, think of a patient who is a cardiac patient who, you know, if an AI comes back from a data standpoint and says, hey, this patient is probably apt to have a heart attack, and that patient gets very worried and the family gets very worried and they find out, eh, incorrect data, that's a bad thing. And so there's things like that that really have to be looked at going forward over the next couple of years, you know, three to five, to really ensure that, you know, AI is being used correctly. This is an article that you all have access to, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, talking about, again, where stats and the information from a data standpoint and the connection into AI is so relevant. And so, again, it's uh, definitely here. It's going to be staying and it's going to be in, in time very, very beneficial to patients going forward. And even from a machine learning standpoint, again, this is another article that Jar will be able to send out to you all. It's about a 90 page, uh, 91 page article. But in essence, again, you know, when it comes to healthcare and, and AI and data bioinformatics and all of the analysis that can be run around that, that's a huge win-win for patients and practitioners around the globe. And then really last but not least, I don't know if you guys saw the news on the 30th, which was Monday, but this is huge. I mean, they're already looking at, again, what to do with AI. They had some of the top corporate folks, leadership at the White House, talking to Biden and others about, okay, here's AI, it's here. What are we going to do with it? You know, where do we make it approachable? Where do we make it 
trustworthy? Where do we make it more importantly reliable? And so it is a huge, huge undertaking from the government standpoint. And then really you flip it over onto the country standpoint, look at other countries around the world, you know, where can they use, where can they use AI inappropriately? You know, there's a big concern there as well. So again, just from a task force studying, this is definitely top of mind. Um, I mentioned SAS. So just to give you some background, SAS Institute, they're based out of Cary, North Carolina, outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. They're one of the world's, if not the world's largest data informatics and data collection companies uh, around the world. Um, they've been around for about 30 years. Dr. Goodnight still owns that group. Uh, they're about a three to $4 billion organization. Um, and all they do is agnostic data analysis. And so they've done that obviously on machine learning. So they've done the jet engines as an example for like Boeing. They do all of the financial kind of data analysis on fraud with credit cards and banking uh, accounts, et cetera. So they're in that marketplace. And they also have been in the healthcare space for a number of years. So they are the um, FDA clinical data analysis group for, for that uh, institution. They do a number of data analysis for all of the large pharma companies around the world. So they're very much in the thick of data analysis and healthcare, which obviously makes it a, a good situation for us. I'm gonna play this for you. Hopefully you all will be able to hear it. Hopefully everybody at home on Zoom will be able to hear this as well. But I thought this will give you, give you kind of a good feel as to, if I can do it. And if I'm not, I'll be like wrong, but let me see. Here it is. Let me come off of it first, then come back on. Control click to link. There we go. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. There you go. Gordy, take one. Marker. Probably two. And it literally opened our eyes to what we were failing to do. There's over a billion individuals now that don't have uh, appropriate services in those underserved areas of the world. They do not have adequate testing. They do not have adequate vaccines or therapeutics. I think we've learned from COVID-19 that pandemics are global, they're not local. Bottom line is we need to have a long-term strategic plan. How do we improve our ability, enhance our manufacturing capability, uh, resilience in laboratories, uh, making sure we have a real-time data system that's basically throughout the United States. We need to get prepared to confront the great pandemic. We don't have real data, contemporary data, actionable data uh, as the norm. That's the basis for public health action. I think it's going to require visionary individuals, both at a governmental level and within the industry and university environment. The vaccine piece, the testing piece, the, the antiviral piece, you know, the manufacture, and even the distribution of these drugs. Data plays uh, an important role in those domains as well. We have the opportunity now in this environment to really look at artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud-based capabilities. We're not restricted anymore. With our partnership with SAS, we are bringing in the value of data analytics. It's going to be hugely beneficial to not only the companies we be going to, but obviously their citizens find out what they have treated and get better. That's what we want to do. With the right data and the right analytics, you can change the trajectory of this next pandemic. So I thought I'd share that with you and just kind of give you some background into what uh, SAS is. I hope I can get out of this one too. Nope. Uh, well, Sorry, guys. Let's say, uh, let me just get out of this real quick and then I can bring it back in. So feel free, answer any questions, raise your hand throughout this. I'm definitely into more of a open kind of talk. So uh, feel free to interject as possible. Um, please. Yeah, so I always thought of SAS was like a, a statistical language. So software as a service, S-A-A-S. -A -A yeah, this is actually SAS, the company. And I'll pull this up, this will help. Um, again, if you go to SAS.com, 
they're again based out of Cary, and, and that's all they do is data analysis. And you probably don't know about them because they they are more of like an agnostic organization that runs the data and does the analysis on that data. And so they run kind of in the background of most companies around the world. Um, you know, I'm just thinking through like, you know, Heather, who's in the back here, is going to a truest event here in a couple of minutes. Uh, she's got to leave, but truest with banking, they're doing work with them. Um, United Health Group, Optum, you know, doing work with them. All of the major, pretty much payer systems on the healthcare side, all doing some type of analysis with them. They actually tap into most of the hospitals should, um, directly as well. So if there's things that a hospital might have for research purposes, et cetera, they do that. And then even on the consulting side, so I'll go into it in a little bit, but even those global system integrators like uh, Accenture's KPMG's, the Ernst and Young's of the world, they're working with them from an analysis standpoint to be able to pull data, analyze that data and give results out of that data. So a huge, huge company. Um, and, and they're tied into government. They're tied into not only U.S. governments, but governments around the world. So yeah, very, very cool company. Other questions? Yeah, this is just something, yeah, just to kind of show you know, and, and some background on our company. I'll go into that in a second, but I started the company three years ago in September. And uh, through that time, you know, we've developed this really neat global partnership with SaaS, um, where it's basically a, a true business to business partnership where we're bringing them data and or they're bringing us customers to bring in data. And it really allows a, a seamless um, kind of throughput for services in the analytics space. So it's a huge win-win for, for both organizations, both in the U.S., but also globally. About 95% of SaaS's data comes from really the developed countries. So pretty much North America and the European market, where they don't have a lot of data, is coming from like Latin America, um, Africa, the APAC area. And so the ability to basically tie in elements of what we're doing and then bring data to them is some of the aspects that they want to partner up with us for. And this is just something, this was an event we were at in uh, Vegas back in September, where again, you look at Microsoft, look at Snowflake, AWS, Intel, you know, obviously, so those are multi-billion dollar companies. I'm a three-year-old company, pretty much still in that startup mode, and we're on page with them, which is pretty cool. So some background real quickly on um, my company. So within the parent company, I've got three organizations under me. I've got a diagnostics division. I've got a Persone Connect division, which is on the global front. And as you saw, Dr. Redfield is on my team, the former CDC director. That's kind of his play where as we're moving our project forward within that organization, it's to go into countries and really start servicing the health side of folks in those countries giving them health records, giving them treatment, giving them, you know, basically pathways of developing a healthcare infrastructure. And so that's that part. And what we're talking about here today is persona analytics. And so basically we're taking data from disparate data sources across all pathways in a healthcare ecosystem, basically moving that data through to have it analyzed. So questions. You know, on the analytics side, it's a total software uh, company. So basically it's tying in data from a number of different uh, sources within a healthcare ecosystem. What our focus in is from a company standpoint is really helping hospitals lower costs in that structure where, you know, today, you know, as you know, with COVID, obviously we all went through that, you know, the cost can be ex exponential and, you know, now they're falling into play where they got the money for COVID, yet now they ran out of money. Now they're kind of having trouble paying some of their bills. And so our whole push is to really show the value of data, the value of analysis, and the value of reducing costs for those hospital systems. And then also looking at specific disease states. Um, our focal point initially, we'll go into it, but is sepsis. And most people don't realize it, but sepsis is a huge, huge burden around the world. About 11 million patients die, which is a heck of a lot more than what has died with COVID, but that's 11 million each year. And then in the U.S., it's close to about 350 to 400,000 people die of sepsis each year. So it's one of those hospital case burdens where you've got a patient who, let's say they're in the hospital, they've had surgery, they go home, and then they come back because they're having complications from sepsis. They actually get double ding. They actually get charged again for that patient because they didn't control that patient while he or she was in the hospital. So it's a huge burden to them in the longstanding uh, treatment of, of sepsis.
and again, with our um, combination of businesses between SAS and Persone, you know, they've really taken it upon themselves to really drive us forward from a company standpoint, helping out with marketing, et cetera. I'm a hundred plus person organization. So I'm not a huge organization. A lot of the work we do is through other businesses. And so this is a good example of, again, the work that they put together for us as a company. So it's pretty beneficial. And as I mentioned with Dr. Redfield on our team, that's a huge win-win. And if you don't remember, he did a lot of work with HIV in Africa back in the early 2000s. He still is well connected into Africa. He goes over there a couple of times a year to talk to the different health ministers over in Africa. So he's a very, very well connected person within the company structure. And again, as I mentioned, sepsis is a deadly, deadly condition, um, definitely a, a huge burden to the healthcare system. So let's talk data. You know, this is something where, and I wish I could move the picture over for you. I can make it smaller, can't I? That would be helpful. There we go. Um, you know, where we come in is trying to figure out, you know, where data is good, where data is bad, what information needs to come into a system, and then what information from that needs to be analyzed. And so that's what we're working on. And so, in essence, sepsis has been looked at for a number of years. I know within the SAS team themselves, they've had about close to three dozen projects that have always been historical when it comes to looking at sepsis and, and kind of the outcomes of sepsis. With what we're doing with them now, because of their ability now to move into the generative AI space is to actually look at real-time analytics. So basically taking in data and making a decision. And that's really huge in the healthcare space. Um, you know, Right now, most of the decisions that are make, being made by hospitals are done with what's called claims data. So basically insurance carrier, uh, Optum, UHG, or uh, Aetna, et cetera, they're taking that information, providing it to the healthcare networks, and people are making decisions off of that information. Well, the problem is that data is about six months, a year, sometimes a year and a half, two years old. That's a huge burden. So you're making a decision on data that was given to me from way back here, where what we're doing with our system is giving data yesterday, they can make a decision on today or even last night. So that's a huge value. And again, where we're looking at is, is sepsis. And so what do you gather? You know, what kind of information? Uh, pretty much in that case, anything and everything you can. Because right now, nobody really knows how to treat sepsis. Uh, unfortunately, sepsis is a condition where it appears, appears rapidly. And unfortunately, that patient goes into a spiral downward pretty quickly. And so time is of the essence. Treatment is of the essence finding out what that patient is really suffering from is of the essence. And so it is a huge, huge cash burden to a lot of these systems. You know, our value is really looking at, hey, what's out there from a data standpoint, an algorithm standpoint to throw data through. And so our intent is working with companies that either have FDA or CE approved. So basically algorithms that have been approved by the governments either here or over in Europe and basically running that data through in real time. So good example is this case here where I've got a group that is based out of the UC San Diego system, um, so UC Health. Uh, they've got a system that's been in two hospitals, uh, about 4,000 plus patients for the last two years. And throughout that process, through their algorithms, they've been able to show about a 17% reduction in sepsis. The national average is about 6%, 17, 6. And I know if I push this into a system, not only within a hospital setting, but also at an at-home setting and also within a long-term care rehab setting, I can probably push that number up to about 20 to 25% in time. So that's a huge win-win for a healthcare system. And again, I mentioned costs. I mean, the actual revenue savings, cost savings, if you want to put it that way, uh, for a typical 250-bed hospital is $4 million. So if you take a huge hospital system that has maybe 100 hospitals, 100 times four each year, there you go. And that's just for hospital people. That's not for people who have been discharged and left the hospital. Those people, if they were to come back, huge expense. If they don't come back, huge savings. So that's, again, where the win-win comes into play. And again, what we're also trying to do is to ensure fatigue. A lot of times, uh, you know, I don't know, raise your hands. Anybody here in the room have, or if you guys want to raise your hand online, that'd be great, uh, who have a healthcare practitioner, nurse, doctor, PA, NP, it's in the family. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So if you ask them tonight, what's the biggest problem you have with stuff that comes off of a computer? It's going to be alerts because they get basically fatigued from all the different alerts that are coming through. It's a big 
pain in the butt, excuse my French, but it really is. And they get tired of it. Um, you know, it's just one of the things where they get to a point where they start ignoring. So our whole intent is to really ensure that any type of system that's put in play within a healthcare network really minimizes the alerts and basically goes back to that practitioner and says, hey, John Doe, Jane Doe, they're really doing poorly or they're really starting to do poorly. You need to go see them now. And this is why. So just some benefits there. And the other thing too, I really want to kind of capture in this discussion is silos. You know, one of the things we're trying to, I'm not going to say break, but at least to uh, enhance, I guess is the best way to put it, are the silos that are being put up by different healthcare networks. So if, uh, you know, Jane Doe or John Doe goes to Cleveland Clinic, as an example, and then they go to Emory down the road here, that information that they gave at Cleveland Clinic, if they went there for a heart surgery or a knee surgery or whatever, is not transferable. That's a big benefit. How does the Emory person know what your health is, what you went through, how are you doing, et cetera? Very, very tough to do that. Same thing from a Mayo standpoint. You know, you've got those silos that are put up between different healthcare organizations and the intent of providing real-time data to kind of the wide variety of healthcare centers is what we're looking to provide. So that's a huge benefit. And then throwing it over to the government side, you know, we're thinking that in probably the next two years, our system will be a potential requirement by CMS, which is the governing body of Medicare and Medicaid, which pays all the bills for the payer systems. So our system that I'll show you here in a second, as we move it forward, the ability to actually have it as a requirement in hospital settings and across a healthcare network, because it's a new ecosystem in healthcare, will be something that will be transformative. So questions up to this point. All right, cool. And I'm making sure and hopefully JAR or somebody can let me know if anybody on the Zoom cast has any questions, ping me on that. So this is what we've designed with SAS. So this has been going on for about a year and a half. Um, and again, this is kind of the broad scope and I'll, I'll show real quickly in, in the next slide, um, some of the other kind of more basics, but kind of walk, I'll walk you through kind of the way it works. So you see here on the bottom of the hospitals. So let's say John Doe, Jane Doe are in a car accident um, and they also are diabetic. Um, John Doe's got a potential cardiac issue. Jane Doe um, you know, might have uh, something that's more of a short-term issue than needs surgery. So they go into the hospital, they go into the ED, ER, ambulance drives up, drops them off. They're seen by a physician, they're moved into an acute care ICU setting and then they're feeling a little better. Now they're moving into a hospital room, feeling a little better. They don't wanna go home, but they're getting kicked out because the government really pushes the people out of the hospital pretty quickly. Then they're discharged and they either go left or right. So left is kind of the diff different um, skill setting. So be it a long-term care rehab facility. And on the right is either a home setting directly or maybe like a hospital at home setting. Um, through COVID, as you probably can imagine, a lot of things are being done in that remote space where you've got patients at home that. Typically, it might be in a long-term care or hospital setting, but they're at home being monitored in some sort of fashion. They're in that right-hand quadrant. And then what we're doing is taking data from all of those different areas. So be it uh, electronic health record system. So if you've ever heard of Epic or Cerner or Oracle Cerner now, um, you know any type of lab or lab information system. So maybe LabCorp or Quest, any type of lab testing that's being done. And then show of hands, how many of you all are wearing either a Samsung watch or an Apple watch? Not that many. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. Surprised actually. Okay. Uh, Fitbit. Well, once going twice. Okay. All right. Um, wow. I thought all oh, you guys to have your hands up on that one, but uh, yeah. So, so any type of monitor, any type of wearable, any type of IOT device that is tied into a health network, be it in the hospital, long-term care rehab, remote patient monitoring system or a hospital at home setting. We're tying into all that data as well. So within our structure, what we're doing is we're normalizing and harmonizing all that data. So basically good data in, good data out, right? So we're taking it all, making it all packageable because what happens, you got the hospital that has an electronic health system, uh, record system. So uh, they've got maybe an Epic system. On the left, long-term care rehab facility might have uh, uh, all scripts or uh, point-click care. On the right, the remote patient monitoring system does their own thing. None of them talk. None of them talk. And so from our standpoint, the whole focus is being able to take that data in, streamline it, to provide it then in for data analytics. So back to you all. So what we're doing here is at the top. So we're working again with SAS. And so we would take an algorithm based on whatever use case, run the data through, 
and basically have analysis done and provided back to that practitioner. So depending upon the use case, the cool thing about SAS VIA, and it's going to be really, really cool quarter one of next year, is the ability to basically set up multiple algorithms to have the data run in real time through. So if you've got basically three or four or five different algorithms, the data can be run through those algorithms at the same time to provide data back. So that's huge. What's really cool, quarter one, and it's going to be a game changer pretty much across most healthcare kind of eco spaces. But primarily, I see the real huge benefit in oncology with cancer patients is the ability to run generative AI on imaging data. They've been doing it with, obviously, machine learning AI, but they'll be actually be able to do generative AI with CT scans, MRIs, et cetera, which is huge. Because again, take a patient who's, let's say, a breast cancer patient. You've got MRIs that have been built, MRIs that are going to be taken. You have medications that are being taken or IVs that have been given. And you can actually literally tra trace and track that patient through that profile to see if the medication IV is actually working. Big win, that's huge. So from our standpoint, that's a huge kind of ad that we'll be able to put in. We thought it was to be about another year before they were going to be able to do that, uh, but they are going to be actually releasing that in quarter one under the VIA engine and VIA platform, which is a huge, huge win-win for us as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of point out on, on this screen is what we're working with. So we work with what's called either anonymized and or de-identified data. So basically it really gives us the ability to push and pull data quite rapidly and through the system. Um, Security-wise, big, big issue, obviously, with personal health records. So to be able to move that data that's de-identified is a huge win-win. But then also it's the side of the ability to, to take that data and do research on it, i.e. the bioinformatics department here, right? So that's kind of the play that we're thinking through is that, you know, as with this data set is built, the ability to pull in students, uh, graduate students, employees at some point to be able to run this information through on a population health side of things from uh, from that side to, uh, you know, potentially drug drug interactions to um, I could see disease state and, and, and disease state analysis and seeing which drugs work better than others. There's you know just a lot of different areas that could be extrapolated into the data sets that are coming in. Questions? Please. Probably, yeah. I mean, I think where it comes into play, like you know, I mentioned like the lab lab information and things of that nature, that probably will be will take be taken in because again, data good data in, good data out. So probably that would be part of what we will be doing. I think that is something where. I, I think we'd love to have an opportunity to have that discussion with you all to, to maybe place that in and see what that does. Um, yeah, I don't I don't see a problem with that at all because again, you're trying to figure out you know what is maybe the best medication to take for that patient because of the DNA that they have. Um, <clears throat> maybe you're planning to talk about this. You mentioned de-identifying data, but what are other security considerations? Having yeah, great question. Uh, HIPAA compliance, so that's that's part of it. So everything's HIPAA under the Azure platform. Um, because we're agnostic from a, a company standpoint, we're going to work with, you know, it, the platform actually, just the background, was built on AWS, and we moved it over to Azure. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, but it is an open architecture type of setting, so we can go under any cloud, any EHR system be pulled in, any data stream to be pulled in, do Python and all that. So that's all set up. Um, so HIPAA, GDPR compliance is the big thing. Um, outside of that, it's just really more of the security portals that we set up within the structure of our company and, and obviously the pathway between us and SaaS. And as mentioned, SaaS really has a lot of lockdowns within their buy engine just because of all the work they do in government and banking and all that. So, yeah, good question, though. Other questions? Just on a granular scale, I'll pull this one up, too. This is kind of giving a heads up on what it looks like within the kind of the structure of how we move the data. Everything is Firebase, HL7. So really, APIs are the way to go for us. That's kind of the global setting within healthcare uh, to be able to move that data back and forth. We'll work with CSV, but APIs kind of work best with us. So just kind of some background there. And then again, the other aspect is, you know, here where I've been talking about the, the physician, right? The, the, the person who's seeing the patient as being the, the clinical decision maker. 
you know, the research application is going to be huge. So the ability to see data, not only from Emory, but the data from Advent Health, the data from uh, Grady, the data from Piedmont, the data from Augusta Hospital, as an example, you know, that's all going to be in the data set. So the ability to not only have organizations within the healthcare setting have access to the data, but also companies. So mentioning the, the algorithms, you know, those algorithms can be enhanced by use of additional data, obviously. So that's going to be a win-win for them as well. So really cool. And then again, you know, outside of sepsis, these are kind of our next kind of pathways for 2024. These are huge, huge healthcare burdens. So everything from congestive heart failure, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, COPD, which is a respiratory problem. Uh, a lot of folks, unfortunately, on the environmental side, get COPD. Uh, and so that's a huge area for us from a business standpoint. And then even with kidney disease and kidney dialysis. Questions? Please. Um, in my we are open to that uh, just because again you know we're, we're our our intent from a company standpoint is to pull in data to then run through the algorithms that are on more the um figuring out if the patient is going into septic shock but that obviously would fall fall into that so yeah yeah and the other thing too within a hospital setting one of the things we, we're going to be doing probably in second quarter of next year within our structure is basically um, geo-identifying a patient. So basically, if that patient's um, in a hospital setting or even in an outpatient setting, um, you know, basically having the ability to, I'm not going to say trace and track, but I'm going to say trace and track that patient through the system. So the cool thing is, is that there's um, pieces in play at a hospital typically or a long-term care facility where not only are you tracing and tracking the patient, but you also have the ability to trace and track the employees. So if you've got a nurse who basically has maybe a some type of a cold or infection, or uh, you come in, uh, into contact with equipment, let's say if you're going into an MRI and that MRI is infected of some, you know, somehow, some way, to be able to trace and track where that patient went, that's also going to be part of this. So that's a pretty cool, cool aspect of it. Please. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of curious in that kind of same vein. We have the identification of data. Uh, how much of that, like, is connected? Is it like uh, we know that there's some patient with like this temperature or these drugs and stuff? We mm -hmm. just don't know like who it is. Or, right. Like, yeah. 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 Basically, the what we do is it's set up with tokens, and so we're, we're just basically you know that patient would have a token that would be identified back to them through their records. So we would never know who Jane Doe or John Doe is, but we know Jane Doe, John Doe's temperature or uh, drug use, et cetera. So yeah, all part of it. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, there's companies, um, Going, I'll go back to this one here. There's companies that uh, basically work in these integration tool spots here where um, one is DataVant. They're a huge global company, uh, D-A-T-A-V-A-N-T. Uh, another one's Rapsi. The last one is a pretty major one is Innovacer. And so those three companies are what are called healthcare data API companies. So they literally pull data from the EHR. They typically will de-identify it, anonymize the data, and then allow that data to be pushed and pulled. So let's talk about AI. Um, who's scared of AI? Anybody? Raise a hand. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, you know, I think where where we come into play, you know, with SAS, obviously, um, you know, actually, SAS, and I should have mentioned, SAS was part of the White House roundtable that happened on Monday, so FYI, so that's obviously a, a good play for us as well. You know, it's really making sure and ensuring the trustworthiness of data, uh, and I think that's where we also come into play as a company, where you know, with us normalizing and harmonizing the data, making sure that the data is good data as it gets anal analyzed. That's a, a huge win-win. And then within the SASFI engine, I mean, their system is set up to where they've got their structure really kind of, I would say, buttoned up to, to ensure that there are kind of no anomalies that are minimal anomalies that come out of it. And so that's a huge win-win for us as a company. Um, but I think it is it is something that will be an ongoing discussion and hopefully over time we'll be able to uh, hopefully minimize the the the, the scaredness of, of of AI. Uh, hopefully, um, you know I don't know if I could help out in in one hundred percent of that case, but uh, hopefully in time I think we'll be able to find out that hey it's working the way it's supposed to work. Other questions. Uh, 
Yeah, great question. So how many of you, this is a great one, great one, because this is pretty fun, actually. How many of you guys or ladies have been in a hospital or a physician's office or clinic in the last two years and filled out on a piece of paper your name and physical history? Raise your hand. No, it's not HIPAA compliance. That was that fun? Okay. So what's really cool is that that is your sign off. You've already signed off, guys. Welcome to my world. And that's really it, you know, because you that's basically one of the documents you're signing off on. Um, so that that kind of alleviates that. But the other thing, going back to that, this is kind of a cool scenario. I mentioned uh, the silos. You know, the problem you guys are, are having, again, that the healthcare system in the U.S. is having, Europe is not as bad. But every time you go to, let's say, uh, Grady, and then you go to Emory or some other system, you're doing the same paper fill out. And that's the silo. That, that's probably the easiest analogy to show you. So everybody's done that. So everybody's probably been through that where you've gone to one doctor, you go to another, have to fill it out again. And you go to another, you have to fill it out again. That's where the silos are. So what we're trying to do is to allow that to be seamless across the board, to have access across the board, to be able to access that information directly. Other questions? Yeah, no, that's a great example. Uh, number one, try to find a different system. That'd be my first uh, thought because obviously they're selling your data. Um, uh, I don't even know. What yeah, no, I, I mean, that's happening across the board. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's a that's a institution concern. That's an institution issue. You know, and that's somebody's getting a hold of it. Somebody's selling it. Somebody's doing something with your data. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that other than going back to the authorities there within that health system, because that's a big, big issue. Because uh, they've identified and it, a little bit different what we're doing. So again, we're all de-identified data. So I've got no, I don't know it's you. You know, I know it's a number associated with you, but I don't know it's you. Whereas they're actually able to get and sell your data that's direct to you and your phone number and all of that. Now, this, the identification, we know that it does work, right? The, uh, the people who have been able to, to very accurately point uh, the person given from this the identified data in any um, our, ours is tokenized the identified. So it actually is one more step further. So that's, again, probably where the difference is as well. Um, where I would be kind of concerned with just your example there, they could have been hacked. And then that information sold. So if you know if it was Piedmont or Emory or whoever, if their data was ever hacked, maybe whoever hacked it is selling it, and that's how it's happening. But don't know. But yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome to the future of data. It's just gonna. Yeah. Please. Oh, so like you mentioned that before, basically, you might not know exactly what they're signing off for. If they're just you know doing regular right work and talking about them, is there any way that I can opt out? Of that at any time. Oh, within the healthcare system? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Or you can like from the model sector and use that. Um, well, what we're doing, so let me kind of give you the business scenario, what we're doing in the back end. I was trying to make it more bioinformatics and data. So what we're doing on our end, so the data that comes out of the system, and this is kind of what it looks like. I'll put this so kind of help you guys out. So the data that's coming out of the system would look like this red line here. So how how a health network, how a hospital 
wants to show the data back, that's up to them. So all we're doing is providing the data. They figure out what they want to show. Is it a percentage? Is it numbers? Is it a 2D, 3D line graph? However they want to display it, they make that choice. A lot of organizations, a lot of healthcare organizations, you'll see things like this, these types of dashboards. And there's actually companies that do dashboarding. So we don't do dashboarding. We just provide the data to go into it. But in essence, in this case, you've got that trend line coming back. And in essence, if a static trend line's there, that's great. If it goes up or down, depending upon how they configure it, that's good or bad. So the healthcare network figures out how they want to transpose the data. As far as going back to your question on saying, you know, I don't want my data shared, that's obviously something you go back to the hospital and tell, number one. But what we're doing on the other side is that when the healthcare network goes into the system and picks the different algorithms to use, that's up to them. So they would pick, you know, one, two, three, four, five different algorithms within the setting. They pick, they choose, and then they go forward with that. If I opt out, if there are other ways to opt out, that's sharing my data, mm -hmm. um, will that data, the data they would have to be used, or will they let's like, say send you uh, a letter saying it's not, or are not used to give anymore, so you opt out? We would we would not it would not be affecting us because the side of getting your data would already be stopped at the wall of that health network. So if I was to go into the health network, the health network would say Jane Doe, John Doe's information cannot be shared because they do not want it shared. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I'll be more thinking like the data that was already collected. Oh, too bad. Because <laughs> you signed off here. We had your data here. Yeah. But my data for any health system I did the US and the right? We could, yes. But it's how you get information from where does is Apple giving away individual types of data? So we would go through two directions on that. So back to this display, which again I'm, I'll take the home environment, right? So in this display, there's a couple different ways. So there are companies that basically have setups, either Apple-ish information. So they connect basically into healthcare data out of the Apple Watch that could be pulled. Or companies like Samsung. So Samsung actually has it already set up. They're a little more open, to be frank. Um, they've got a division called Harman, which within uh, within Samsung. So Harman has a number of devices, blood pressure cuffs, pulse socks, et cetera, that they tie data into. And then basically they streamline that data into a system. So the remote patient monitoring companies might have their own watch. There's a couple of companies we're working with, uh, one in Israel as an example, another one out of Memphis that have different devices already set that they pull data in from. So it really is open to whomever that healthcare network is working with at the home environment or what long-term care rehab facility is using at that setting. But yeah, going back to the Apple Watch, there's companies that we can pull data from. There's a company that we're working with out of New York that literally has the direct feed of pulling data from an Apple Watch and pulling it into our system. Yeah, pretty cool. I have another question. Uh, uh, how how is it, you know, this system is making like clinical decisions or helping doctors make clinical decisions? Uh, how is it with the uh, uh, with legal liability? Like, I know now, uh, uh, you know, they do so many different systems for billing, but it's already happened when I uh, complain that they double bill me. They say, we didn't do it, you know? So, so is that going to be uh, the same thing? Computer did it, it's not our fault. No, no, within the system settings. So we're, we are not making a decision. We're providing the data back to make a decision for the healthcare system, the practitioner. So we're just providing additional data that they never had before because they've never had real-time data like this. I'm um, going back to your Apple Watch question. So every like ECG, EKG that we're pulling, it's 10 second increments. So it's not the whole continuous, but it's 10 second increments of that information. So they've never had anything like this where it has the data coming in and then also have the, having the real time analysis. From a uh, regulation standpoint, HIPAA, GDPR is all the system needs because we're not making a decision. Still, still the doctor, the responsibility yep. for it. Yep. For the and, and legally they cannot blame your system. Correct. Please, sorry, you had a question. Right? Access data. How do you access data? I'm sorry. Who has access to this data? So, like, if you want to look at it, you need to look at what person has to do. Mm -hmm. 
you want to look at well, diagnosis or the diagnosis to the treatment outcome compare that across multiple patients. I mean, yep. How would you access that? Big cloud. Yeah, so we have uh anyone that's in that's part of the platform correct yeah that's the basically it's the data sharing system that we would have um one of the things we're looking at doing country wise is um putting in country servers so the data would ha be housed in country because a lot of legal limits around you know some certain countries um and then being able to still share the anonymized data out of that type of system <laughs> Um, are you guys storing the data yourselves? Or are you building queries to queries people from uh, each hospital? Data? Yeah, yeah, great question. So that yes, so that's where the integration tools come into play. So it's the queries come in, yes, but then the data that we're getting and normalizing, harmonizing, that is up in the cloud. So we are keeping that data up in the cloud. But again, it's anonymized data. But again, it goes back to and the reason and rationale around that is to go back to this one here, where it's this. We know, you know, I've got a master collaboration agreement with you all. So FYI, I've got an NDA with UGA. I've got a master collaboration with UGA. So we're looking at doing a lot of work with you all. But um, I've got one with Johns Hopkins. I've got one with Advent Health. Um, I've got one with Wake Med. And it's close to uh, Cary, close to SAS. You know, and, and in those institutions, obviously Johns Hopkins being probably the primary and UGA, you know, the ability to actually do research on the data and research on the clinical side, research on the population health side, et cetera, is all kind of the accessible part of ensuring that, you know, the data is there to really make decisions, decisions better, decisions quicker. Pretty cool. I wonder if you're marketing to first production first. Haven't been. No. Uh, most of it's been infectious disease because of sepsis. A lot of it's been to the chief medical officers and kind of that side of the business. And then also on the IT side, the CIOs and, and uh, uh, the folks that run really run and the CFOs really because of the cost structure. But those elements just because of the connectivity and what the data is providing back to them. But that's a good idea now in the risk reduction. Yeah, because you figure within the structure of the hospital system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Take that as a note. Yeah. Yeah. And going back, going back to the screen here with the, the system integrators, you know, and the reason we did that again, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fast moving company, but, you know, I don't have enough boots on the ground to really get this from a scalable standpoint up and running, you know, across the world. And so with these GSIs, the, you know, KPMGs, Deloitte's, Accenture's, you know, they've got thousands of people that are already on the ground, already doing consulting work with these hospitals, et cetera. So they literally are going in and doing the integration work. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that in clinical trials. You know, one of the things, and as I mentioned with SAS, you know, they do like you know, Pfizer, GSK, all the biggies. They do all the clinical data analysis on the clinical trials that are being run. And then they do the FDA clinical analysis. So it's setting it up for, you know, quick approval through the FDA. Um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely that. And then on the clinical trial side, to really have a real-time clinical trial where you can actually trace and track a patient with different monitoring tools. You know, they're on a medication. You figure out when that medication starts to work and or not work and or side effects in real time. Yeah. yeah. Well, in particular, what I'm thinking about, since you're focused on sepsis, I mean, you're looking at pregnant women, Women have just delivered, mm -hmm. right? So that's a big problem in Georgia. We know there's significant health disparities on that. Yep. And the risk factors aren't exactly known, but are probably pretty likely to be harvested from the model. Yeah. So again, it's sort of a way that you might think about a case case scenario that mm -hmm. apply your home audience with. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and again, we're not we're not building algorithms. We go we put it up to the researchers and the companies out there to uh, bring those to us. But yeah, that would be something where it'd be a really good good project for that to work on. So you present the data that you capture from those algorithms to the doctors. How do you ensure that it's presented in like an unbiased way? I guess you better just have a neutral view of how to Yeah. Yeah, again, that's because of the algorithms, number one, because again, they're FDA and CE approved algorithms. 
Um, so they've already gone through the kind of analysis part of it. <clears throat> um, the other aspect would be, you know, obviously SaaS and the ability of them to run the data through their systems and basically using their tools to figure out if it's accurate or not. Um, that's kind of the, the way we feel it's going to be the best, to be honest. And then again, we're just streamlining the data back. So as I showed that trend line, that's kind of how we're providing the data back. So we would provide data back then based on those algorithms, hey, that patient's doing well, static, patient's not doing well. We don't go, we don't want to go that way because that just wouldn't look good. But if they go, if it starts going up, then obviously that's a bad, bad scenario. Or they can put numbers or percentages. I'm, I'm sorry, I had a hard time hearing the last part. You guys uh, stored any Not yet. And Jara, I don't know if you can hear me, but I didn't know if anybody on the Zoom call has any questions. I haven't seen any pop up yet, but uh, there's two people. Uh, you mentioned the regeneration data. Uh, do you uh, when you're saying commercial, like from a company, um, so the algorithms, okay. So the, uh, one of the ones I mentioned came out of UC San Diego, but it came through a commercial organization. So it's a commercial company. Um, another one that's a major one, it's actually probably one of the major ones. I can't name it yet because it's not signed, but we're getting to the point where we'll be signing. Um, it's a major, major one, again, from a company. Um, if it's a research organization, as long as it's FDA or C approved, we're good with that. So if it's somebody that's, that's pushed it through on their own element within a research institution, we'll do that. Um, but that's, that's all we're doing within our system currently. One of the things we will be doing is if a algorithm group, be it a research institution or a commercial company, wants to throw an algorithm into ours to run data to basically see how it works and then go to the FDA with it or CE, that's also a pathway. That's probably 24, uh, late 24, we'll be doing that. Yeah, but everything we're doing right now is more FDA, CE. Does that answer your question? Okay. I was wondering, you want to say what kind of people you were looking for in terms of hiring? Yeah, so again, um, we hired three UCF students uh, last year. So they were, um, again, I should have explained. So uh, my IT and finance group was down in Jacksonville, Florida. So it was close enough from Orlando to have the folks either work virtually uh, or go into the office over in Jacksonville, Florida. But really where we're looking at is um, everything from, you know, population health projects. As we talked about earlier, with even like the pregnancy side, it's a, that definitely a population health project. Um, you know, from a bioinformatics standpoint, again, as the data is being pulled in, you know, what other aspects can we look at? Can we look at disease trends? Can we look at, uh, you know, clinical treatment trends? Can we look at uh, pharmaceutical outcome information where, you know, is it good, good pharmaceutical use or is it bad pharmaceutical use? I mean, are they putting a 45-year-old patient on a medication that should be used for a 65-year-old patient because of the data coming in? So there's all of those kind of aspects. Um, and then I think, you know, as we move forward, there's also the financial side. I think as it moves into a, a kind of a global setting, the ability to actually figure out, okay, this is working over here, over in, let's say, Turkey, compared to where, you know, hospitals in the U.S. are not maybe using the right protocols or the right, you know, treatment, uh, treatment protocols, et cetera. So that's kind of the aspect of it as well. Anything and everything, we're open. Because I think that, you know, the data that's coming in, even with what we're doing right now, um, data-wise, I mean, it's a heck of a lot of data. Take an image of MRI, scan. I mean, that's a heck of a lot of data. And again, you know, I think as it's being analyzed and you look at, a, like I said, a breast cancer patient or a prostate cancer patient, see if it works, see if their medication protocol works. Game changer. Please. <clears throat> Thank you.
So our information goes back as a time series data stream that is analyzed every 10 minutes or sooner. So if no data is coming in, nothing's new coming in, it's every 10 minutes, rerun. And then as new data comes in, it's automatically run. So anytime, so if it is, a, let's say they've got a continuous monitor or they've got a, a blood test that came in or an EHR record that's come in, um, pulse ox measurement, it's real time. Yeah, and it's actually, you know, for us, <clears throat> how many of you all are familiar with the word, the edge with regards to data analytics? Wow, okay. That's a shock too. And no Apple Watches or steps away. Um, uh, so, so the edge, the edge is kind of the new plateau within data analytics. So as you all know, you know, information comes in on a continuous stream from an Apple Watch or from a monitor, et cetera. So the edge is actually giving the ability to analyze that information that might take seconds to literally analyze it, boom, done. So the edge is literally the edge. So data comes in, it's analyzed. Data comes in, it's analyzed. So that is kind of the forefront of what uh, SAS will be doing with analytics here in the next probably two years, if not sooner. Um, and that's gonna be also very, very cool because instead of like us right now, as I mentioned, when I've got a continuous stream of data, I'm taking a 10 second increment. And the reason is because there's so much darn data, even in 10 seconds, you have a MRI that's being done and that's a ton of data. And so the ability to actually take data from an edge component and have it come in and analyze right away, you don't have to take that 10 second increment. So that's kind of what we're doing. Other questions? I'm done with my presentation, but you got any others? Yeah, let me see. Thank you. Let's see. <laughs> oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you guys are on the Zoom. If you have any questions, chat them in. I should have mentioned that. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Um, all right, and real quick for me. So how many of you all have and or are working in healthcare of some sort with anything you guys are doing project-wise? Okay, one, couple, okay. And how about um, aviation? Banking, agriculture, really? Oh, wow, okay. Uh, what am I missing? What other areas? Okay, thank you. So that's, it. so that's health, okay, I'll give you that. Anything else outside of that? No chats have come up either, okay. Very cool, well, good luck with everything else. How many of you have less than six months before graduation? All right, so you guys are slacking, I can tell. Okay, good, good. Oh, four people on Zoom, all right. Yeah, and as I said, yeah, my, uh, my just a background too, I mentioned the two two boys. So one of them did an internship at uh, GP at Georgia Pacific last uh, summer. And so he actually already got hired, so that's really cool. Uh, so he's actually working for them now and, and going to work after he graduates. And uh, he's already gotten into that, oh, I'm graduating <laughs> modality. So a B is as good as an A, but yeah, not bad. I've had a father or son talk with him, so hopefully that'll change. Uh, but really appreciate the questions all. I, it was a fabulous to have a conversation with you all. I appreciate the time and hopefully you learned something from it. Um, hopefully the edge, look it up. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, Apple watches are pretty awesome. So thank you all.